We've gathered to share an old story, familiar and dearly loved. Yet somehow every year, the wonder of it all becomes new once more. Our hearts are stirred to celebrate, to sing, to repeat the sounding joy. that night so long ago the shepherds on the hills had settled in and all was quiet except for the crackling of the dying embers of a campfire and the rustling of a few restless lambs 
But heaven had a surprise in store. Midnight turned bright with the glory of the angelic host, sharing good news of great joy, a love song that fell across the hillside like a blanket of peace. amazing gift of love. No room for the long-awaited Messiah. No room for our only hope of salvation. No room. No room. Time and again, these two simple words stir our hearts, and we vow to make sure it never happens with us. Our prayer becomes, Father, don't let me feel Christmas with anything but who Jesus is and the reason he came the way he came.
Well, good evening and welcome to Grace Bible Church. We're glad that you're here tonight and I hope that you have come to worship. If you're here for the first time and visiting with us, let me encourage you on your way out to pick up one of the coffee cups out there as a gift. There's some extra ones out there if we run out. And also one of the videos out there as a gift from Grace Bible Church. You'll also find in the um, seat in front of you a brochure about the church that gives the times of services. And if this is your first time with us and you don't have a Bible-believing teaching church that you're a part of this evening, we would invite you to consider making Grace Bible Church your home church. If you already attend a good Bible-believing teaching church, be faithful to it. Just continue to attend there and support the pastor and uh, be involved in ministry. But we're glad that you're here tonight. I want to mention a few things that are coming up here at Grace. Uh, this coming Saturday night is Christmas Eve, and so we have a 7 p.m. candlelight service. Uh, you would all be invited to that. We'd love to have you come. It's just a simple way of bringing in Christmas together. And then on Sunday, Sunday is Christmas, we only have one service. For those of you that uh, regularly attend and those of you who may attend, we don't have on, on that particular Sunday or the Sunday following that, which will be New Year's Day, uh, we won't be having an 8.30 service, we won't be having Sunday school, and we won't be having the 6 p.m. service. We're just having the 10.50 service on those days. We realize that a lot of you will be spending time with your families, and we want to give you all the time to do that. And yet, we don't want to leave the Lord out of Christmas. We want to have a worship service and recognize Him and honor Him and worship Him on that day. So we will have a 10.50 a.m. service, and everyone here would be invited. Bring your friends. Everyone is welcome. At this time, um, we're going to take up our uh, offering. If you're our guest tonight, don't feel compelled to give. Um, we didn't ask you or invite you, and I'm sure whoever invited you didn't invite you to come to give money. Uh, the Lord takes care of things around here at Grace Bible Church. In fact, we have been very blessed here. Everything is paid for here at Grace Bible Church. We have no mortgage. Our, all of our facilities are paid for including our gym, which we managed to pay off. We built the gym. It was about $750,000. And although we're not a big church, the Lord blessed us, and we were able to pay that off in a period of about 10 years, which to me is a, a minor miracle in and of itself. But uh, the Lord indeed blessed us with that. So uh, just feel free to be our guest this evening. Uh, but at this time, as we prepare our hearts for the offering, I'd, I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. And uh, we thank you for this time of year again when we can remember and celebrate what you have done for us through the giving of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who took on flesh, who dwelt among humanity, who willingly gave up his life as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sins, for us, so that we could have eternal life, so that we could have a relationship with you, so that we could know that we're going to heaven simply by faith in Him, trusting in what He did on the cross for us. Father, my prayer is that if there's anybody here tonight that doesn't know Jesus, that they would tonight accept Him as their Savior. He's the reason for Christmas. Father, we thank You for Your blessings here at Grace. We pray that You would continue to bless us, and we pray that through this evening we would worship and adore You as You rightly deserve in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're happy that you're all here tonight, enjoying and participating with us in this worship experience, and we want to include you in that as we sing a couple of songs together. The words are up on the screen. I hope that you will join us, and let's begin with, O Come All Ye Faithful.
you. You may be seated. When did the Bethlehem night, the shepherds on the hills, the song of the heavenly host, the scene of the baby asleep in a manger, when did it become the narrative that we cherish today? Mary had stored all those memories in her heart for so long, and Luke must have listened in wonder as she recounted every detail, but they couldn't have imagined how every word lead us back to the manger each year to fall in worship.
John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is Jesus, the Savior the shepherds worshipped when they found him in a manger. And he is the one we worship today. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace.
word that is synonymous with Christmas. It signifies the Savior's birth. It implies a shout of joy and a song of praise. It calls us to return to the main to behold the miracle of Emmanuel, God with us.
In a distant land, men who had devoted their lives to study and learning saw the new star God had prepared to celebrate the incarnation of his son. They interpreted the sign of the sky just as the
As we get near the end of this song, we invite you to sing it with us. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in still another village, where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He didn't go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things one usually associates with greatness. And yet, all of the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man on earth as that one solitary figure. That one man, Jesus, became sin on our behalf, so that when he was crucified, he made a way for us to have a new relationship with our Heavenly Father. And on the third day, when he arose from the dead, the power that raised him now gives us the chance to live with him and worship him eternally in heaven. We invite you once more to come. Behold him for who he truly is, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who shall reign forevermore. Darkness. 
Amen. Amen. He shall reign forevermore. Thank you. I was going to say boys and girls. Thank you, girls. <laughs> we had all female singers up here, and they did a wonderful job. Thank you. You know, uh, when I was younger, I went to goof high, I mean golf high, <laughs> my brothers and I, and we graduated from there. And while I was a student there, uh, there was a young man that went to school with us named Chuck Pickcock. You know, I, I can't even get the adults to laugh at my jokes, so I, I appreciate that. I need to bring these kids here more often. <laughs> uh, thank you, parents, for bringing your children here, too. They're, they're a blessing. <laughs> uh, Chuck, at the age of 15, was uh, a big guy, but sort of clumsy. And sometimes we, we rode motorcycles together, and we would pick on him and uh, slap Anyway, sometimes we weren't so nice to Chuck, but we remained friends. Then one day I came back from college and I was standing in line at the credit union, putting money in the bank or doing something, I can't remember what I was doing, when all of a sudden this guy came up behind me and I didn't know who it was, and these arms as big as my legs reached around me, grabbed me and picked me up off the ground and said, hey Pratt! He set me down and I turned around to see who it was and it was Chuck Pickcock. He'd grown up. Maybe some of you recognize his name. He played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for a while and uh, had, had grown up, gone off to college, and became a big guy. Chuck had grown up. And you know, sometimes when we think of the Christmas story, we sometimes leave Jesus, I think, as a little baby in the manger, harmless and innocent, and cute and cuddly, but with no real power and with no real authority over our lives. And yet the Bible portrays quite a different picture of Christ. Yes, He came that first time as a baby in a manger, an obscure village in ancient Judea. But the Bible makes it clear that He will come again. On Sunday mornings, we've been going through some of the various Old Testament prophecies that we find in the Old Testament that predict the coming Messiah and aspects of His first coming. We learn, uh, for example, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, where he would be born. It mentions Bethlehem as being the birthplace of the coming Messiah. Uh, we see in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that he would have a very unique birth, that he would be born of a virgin. We see in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, that he would be different than any other child and that he would be called and would be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace the everlasting Father, this child that was born would be extremely unique. And we know that He came to die for our sins, but He didn't remain as a simple little baby in a manger. He grew up. And there will be a time when the Messiah comes again. There will be a second coming. We've been talking about that again on Sunday mornings. There's the first coming of Jesus, the Messiah, but there is also the second coming of Jesus the Messiah. And let me read to you a little bit about that coming. There are multiple passages in the Old Testament and in the New that deal with this particular aspect, His second coming. But let me read to you just from Zechariah, since it's a passage that we've been studying here at Grace Bible Church on Sunday mornings. In chapter 14, verse 1, actually I'll just start in verse 3, it says, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations. These are the nations that gather against Jerusalem in the end of times. As he fights in the day of battle, on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from the east to the west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day there will be no light, no cold, nor frost. It will be a unique day without daytime or nighttime, a day known to the Lord. When evening comes, there will be light. In other words, when it gets dark, it'll, it'll still be light. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half to the eastern shore and half to the western sea, in summer and in winter. 
The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord and his name the only name. Jesus is coming again. And when he comes again, there will be a day of reckoning. There will be a judgment day. Remember the Terminator movies and Judgment Day? Well, there is a Judgment Day coming when God, through His Son, will hold the whole earth accountable for what they have done with Him, what they have done with His Son in reference to His first coming. For as we've heard tonight, as the children have been singing and as the adults have been singing, Jesus came into this world as the Lamb of God. It was prophesied about, and so it was fulfilled. He came into this world not simply to grow up to to show us how to live, but to give his life as a sacrifice for our sins. In fact, there's a passage in the Old Testament that was written 700 years, 700 years before it ever came about. And yet it sounds like something we would read in the New Testament about Jesus. And that's because it is about Jesus. But it was written by the prophet Isaiah, again, almost 700 years before Jesus was born. It says this in Isaiah 53, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before us like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that would, sh- that would make us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. Jesus came into the world. He took on flesh to die in our place, to die in your place, to be the satisfactory payment of God's wrath for you and for me so that we could have eternal life, so that we could live with a holy and just God forever and forever. I don't know if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But tonight I want to encourage you to do that. And I'd like to close just this, this brief time. We're going to have a finale here in just a minute, so don't, don't leave after the prayer. But I'd like to close this brief time with a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want to ask you a question with your heads bowed and eyes closed. If you were to die today and stand at the gates of heaven and Jesus were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say to him? If you're thinking, well, I, I, I try to be a good person. I try to live a halfway decent life. I've been baptized. I, I do this or I do that. All of those answers would be wrong. See, the Bible says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saves us. It also says in Ephesians chapter 2 that it is by grace that we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves that is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ, by having faith in Him and what He did on the cross of Calvary where He died in our place so that we could have eternal life. If you have never put your trust, your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation before, that's what Christmas is all about. That's what Christmas is all about. And I would encourage you tonight, even now, in the quietness of your mind, to simply talk with God. And if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again, then why don't you right now, just the best you know how, put your trust in Him. And maybe call out to him for forgiveness and salvation with a prayer like this. Father in heaven, I believe that you sent your son, Jesus, into the world to die on the cross for my sins so that I could be forgiven and have eternal life. And right now, the best I know how, I'm putting all of my faith, all of my trust in Jesus and what he did for me for my salvation. 
Forgive me of my sins. Be my Savior. I'm trusting in Jesus. With heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer tonight, I want to rejoice with you. To me, it's what, it's what Christmas is all about. It's why He came into the world. And I'm going to ask you to just wave at me for just a second if you prayed that prayer and asked Christ to be your Savior. Is there anyone here tonight that you're saying, Pastor Dean, I put my faith. Okay, I see your hand. Good. Is there anyone else? Just a quick little wave. Anyone else that's saying, Pastor Dean, tonight I trusted Christ. Well, uh, okay, thank you. Go ahead and put your hands down. Anyone else? Now, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you that if you did that tonight, the next five people that you talk to tonight, talk to them about the Lord and just say, hey, I trusted Christ as my Savior tonight. There's no greater news than to know that someone has trusted Christ as their Savior. Father in heaven, as we get ready to close this program tonight, we recognize that Christ didn't remain a baby. He grew up. He grew in wisdom and he grew in stature and he grew in favor with you. And then he demonstrated his deity through the miracles that he did and his power over nature. He cast out demons and healed the sick. He did those things which no ordinary human being could ever do. And he proved to all who were willing to listen and had an open heart and an open mind that he was indeed the promised Messiah predicted so long ago in the Old Testament Scriptures. And Father, as we contemplate Christmas, help us to remember that he is coming again and that he desires for us to live life in a way that pleases him. Not so that we can gain salvation, because we can't gain salvation. He can only give it to us as a gift. We only receive it. But so that we might please our Heavenly Father. Help us to remember that Jesus grew up and He has all power and deserves all honor and all glory. Help us to give it to Him. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 2, 17 and 18 says, After the shepherds had seen him, they told everyone. They reported what the angel had said about this child. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And just like the shepherds, once we find Jesus, once we understand the incredible gift
Do you have a presentation, David? Thank you, Diane. Well, again, I'd like to thank you for coming tonight. If you uh, don't have a place to worship this Christmas Eve, again, I'd like to invite you here to Grace at 7 p.m. And then maybe to consider coming on Sunday mornings. We've been doing a fantastic study on prophecy in the Old Testament and how it helps to validate the inspiration of the Scriptures in the mind of those people who are searching to understand and to know why we believe the Bible is actually the Word of God and how it is unique in that. And so I'd encourage you, I'd invite you uh, to join us on Sunday mornings. Let's stand and close with a, a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love that you've displayed to us through Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, and his death on the cross for our sins. Uh, we can never say thank you enough, but we do say thank you. Father, dismiss us with your blessings. Help each and every family here to have a wonderful Christmas together with their families and with loved ones. Keep people safe who may be traveling from one place to another to visit those loved ones. And then bring us back together again to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And if I don't get to see you before Christmas, Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.